Hi everybody, I'm Heath, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at this. This is the Dragon Prince Tales of Zadia role-playing game, and I picked this up for two reasons. The first reason was that I enjoyed the show, and the second reason is it uses the Codex system, which some friends of mine told me that I should really look at because I'm interested in uh, RPG systems that facilitate storytelling at the table, and I was told the Cortex system, which this uses, is uh, really good at that, and I didn't really know anything about that system. So when I saw there was going to be a Dragon Prince role-playing game and it used this system that uh, friends had told me I need to check out, I went ahead and bought it, or pre-ordered it, and the book has now arrived. Now, I'm not going to go over this uh, book in a whole lot of detail in this video because I already went over the Tales of Zadia rules primer that was available online that I had access to before the uh, physical book showed up, and there was a lot of detail about how to play the game in the online primer, and that surprised me. There was so much information there, but there was. That was great. We went over that in a video series on the channel, and then also I do understand there has been some changes from the online primer to the physical book as it was published, and people have been uh, leaving comments in the comments section about things that have changed, and I really appreciate that. That's very useful to everybody. So rather than doing a real deep dive into the role-playing game this time, I'm going to do kind of an overview here, looking through the book and checking out some of the different aspects that uh, I think might be really nice uh, for storytelling in games. Let's get to it. All right, let's see what we got. All right, so this looks like introduction to the world of Zadia itself, which is definitely important. Okay, Cortex, that's the rule system we're using here, so welcome to Cortex. So this system does use our polyhedral dice sets, and then we're going to be constructing dice pools here. It says anytime you need to roll a die, the numbers you get on the die is called the result. Usually you choose two results and add them together for the total. Adding two or more results together is about the only math you need to do in Tales of Zadia. A third die from your dice pool, called the effect die, might be chosen to show the impact of your success. So you're choosing two out of your dice pool, adding them together, and then you also have the effect die, and you may want to use the largest die in your pool as the effect die, which means it would be great if you could basically succeed the difficulty of your task by adding together the numbers from two smaller kinds of dice, leaving your largest kind of dice to be your effect dice. So all characters in Tales of Zadia, whether they're NPCs or PCs, are described using game traits. Traits cover a range of descriptive elements grouped into trait sets. These include attributes, values, distinctions, assets, and specialties. And I think this is going to be very important here because this is how you're going to construct your dice pool and uh, what's basically contributing to the action resolution mechanic. So what kind of character traits can you expect to find in Tales of Zadia? Here's a quick list. Attributes include agility, awareness, influence, intellect, spirit, and strength. Values include devotion, glory, justice, liberty, mastery, truth. And distinctions include kindred, vocations, and quirk. Stepping up and stepping down dice is important. So if you step up a d4, you get to a d6. If you step down a d10, you get to a d8. And then also important is this hitches and botches right here. Any die that comes up with a 1 is called a hitch, and that has special uh, rules that go along with it. Now, we also do have this thing called plot points right here, which are a way for players to affect the tale beyond the roll of dice or their own choices. Plot points can be spent to give yourself more dice in your dice pool, make the dice you have more powerful, or activate certain traits or special effects for your character. Stress is the name for bad things that can happen to your character. And this was something that I really liked here, so I'm going to put uh, this basic stress flag here because there are six different types afraid angry corrupted exhausted injured and insecure and so that's different ways that things can happen to you because a lot of rpgs definitely focus on uh the injured right and so that's definitely important when you're talking about combat but it does make the game very combat focused if the only thing that's kind of bad that can happen to your character and take it out of the game is injury, such as hit points in Dungeons and Dragons. So I really like this idea of having multiple things that could take you out, afraid, angry, corrupted, exhausted, injured, and insecure. And you're going to have different tolerances in all of these different areas. And so if stress is stepped up beyond a d12 for any reason, the character becomes stressed out. A stressed out character can't do anything until their stress is recovered or reduced. 
Stress that lasts longer or is much worse is called trauma. You gain trauma once you're stressed out. If you recover your stress and get rid of it, trauma stays around and must be recovered using more time and help. I, I like that. I like the... Uh, I think I like the stress system in this game. Here is our example character, which uses Rayla. Very suitable. So we can see that her values are devotion, glory, justice, liberty, mastery, and truth. And I think everybody had those values, but then depending on what die is associated with them determines what kind of influence that value has over that character. So she's got a d10 in devotion, but she only has a d4 in uh, glory. So she's much more interested in devotion. Love and devotion compel and define me much more than seeking glory. Now we get to a gazetteer of Zadia. Timeline of events. I think this will be a lot of fun to read through. I'd like to be able to... Uh, I'd like to know more about the world, so I think this will be worth doing. But I don't think it's worth doing for uh, this video here. So this is clearly trying to be, uh, you know, the all-in-one book. Because we've got uh, information on the game world and also the gameplay. Information on dragons, obviously very important in the Tales of Zadia. Lots of different kinds of dragons. Star dragons. Zadian creatures. It says if a creature wants to play along with a PC, it can become an asset. See page 70. Not a lot of stats here. Okay, now we get to Player's Guide your first character, and it does say pre-made or original, and I like that it comes with pre-made characters. I am a big fan of pre-made characters in general in order to get to the gameplay faster, so I like books that come with pre-generated characters. So this comes with quite a few uh, pre-generated characters. Okay, now understanding your character, your attributes, they are agility, awareness, influence, intellect, spirit, and strength. Agility, hand-eye coordination. Awareness is your ability to perceive your surroundings and other people. Influence is your presence and persuasiveness. Intellect is your capability to comprehend, capacity to comprehend. Spirit is your mental resolve and emotional reserves. Strength is your level of physical fitness and power. Now, values. You're about to embark on a story set in the world of Zadia, so you need to know what matters to you and why you do what you do. This is represented by your values. Devotion, glory, justice, liberty, mastery, and truth. Each character's investment in these six traits runs from the barely interested D4 to the supremely committed D12. The bigger the die rating, the more the value helps you in your journey. And each one of these has a value statement associated with it. So D4 means this hardly matters to me. D6, this matters, but so do many things. D8, this is important to me. D10, this is a major part of my life. D12, this is my heart and soul. Goals. During play, you can declare up to three goals linked to your values. Each of these at a different die rating of D6 to D12. Goals are things you would like to achieve during the story, such as rescue my sister or explore the hidden grove. Each goal must be tied to a value, and the value's die rating determines the maximum die rating the goal can be set to. Once you achieve a goal, its die rating gets added to your growth pool. See 104 for more on setting and achieving goals. Distinctions. That's who you are and where you come from. What do others remember about you? You are the grand sum of your distinctions. Every player starts with three distinctions rated at D8, and players may change them or raise their die rating over time. Distinctions each belong to three broad groups. Your character's background, kindred, or ancestry. Your character's training, vocation, or role. Your character's most memorable or peculiar quirk or feature. Kindred. Most PCs are either human or elf. Vocation. Your vocational distinction represents what you are and what you do with your life at a young age, making it part of your youth and upbringing, such as calm soldier. Your vocation distinction always comes with an adjective. Oh, I like the application of adjectives. I was thinking about that in character generation uh, for another system. So this can differentiate two characters with the same basic vocation. A calm soldier is not the same as a battle-worn soldier. I like that. Quirk. An asset is something helpful that is, uh, isn't an inherent part of you, such as a primal stone or an enchanted staff, a glow toad, or a faithful squire. So the assets can be D6 to D8, but might go as high as 12. Here is our stress right here. Recovering stress. You can recover stress dice when your PC has time to rest, recuperate, or gain the benefits of medicine. Spending a power point, or a plot point, that's PP, plot point. You can step down one of your stress dice when the narrator rolls an opportunity. And I believe an opportunity is when a narrator rolls a 1 on one of the dice used in one of the contests uh, that you're involved in. This represents shaking it off, taking a breath, or realizing that it wasn't as bad as you thought. When a stress dice is stepped below D4, remove it from your character journal. 
Friends can test to recover your stress for you. Depending on how well they roll, they can even step down your stress or eliminate your stress completely. And I think there was a, a really important thing about maybe by the time you get to trauma, other characters having to help you out. And I really liked that too. So the dice pool represents all the things that contribute to your success. Attributes, values, and distinctions. There's no maximum number of dice in the dice pool, but generally the pool includes three to six dice. The more dice and the higher the rating, the more likely the odds will be in your favor. All the more reason to seek out situations where you can play to your strengths. So Babacor, Cam's PC, starts a contest with an NC. Cam decides Babacar's approach by building his dice pool. Cam chooses strength for the attribute. Babacar uses force to succeed, justice for the value motivating his action, and his simplicity is the best solution distinction. Babacar isn't going for a nuanced approach. Looking for Babacar's specialties and assets, Cam asks if his Circulus Luminous Ring of Light spell is appropriate. Joe, the narrator, agrees, and Cam adds Sun Magic and Sun Magic spells to his dice pool. Joe confirms the NPC has exhausted D6 stress that Babacar can reasonably include. Cam activates Babacar's Heat Being special effect, stepping up his Strength D6 and Agility D8 for the rest of the contest, gaining Angry Stress as an exchange. So that must mean right here, this is all of the dice that uh, the character has been able to bring to bear on this problem. When you roll the dice, you want a higher total than your opposition. That's the core principle of the game. When you roll two or more dice, you choose the two results to add together from your total and a third dice for the effect die. If you roll one die, your total equals the result of that die. If you don't have an available die, your effect die starts at D4. Your effect die indicates how well your efforts did beyond a simple pass or fail. When you choose the effect die, the number it rolled doesn't matter, just the size of the die. And I think it's very interesting. Now, we do have this distinction between tests, challenges, and contests. And we talked a lot about that when we went over the rules primer. And I remember not all of it being completely clear to me, and I don't remember it all now, so I won't try to get into this. But tests are your basic one where the narrator assembles an opposition pool and rolls first so you know the difficulty you have to beat. So I think it's interesting that you, the narrator doesn't just set difficulties like they do in other games like D&D. The narrator is always going to be rolling dice to set the difficulty level of something. So more dice rolling. If you like rolling dice, you got it in here. Lots more to go through here. Now here is all of our information on plot points. Spending plot points as a player, create a special effect, create a temporary asset, include more results, keep an extra effect die, share an asset, activate opportunities. When the narrator rolls an opportunity, which is the same as a player rolling a hitch, you can spend one plot point to activate the roll that is opposing you. So yes, the ones where the hitches, when the player rolls it, they're an opportunity for the player when the game master rolls them. Taking stress. Your character takes stress when they fail a test, challenge, or contest. The size of the stress die is equal to the effect die of the opposition pool. Whoever inflicted the stress die gets to choose what type of stress it is based on the nature of the test, contest, or challenge. If the effect die is D4, the stress is stepped up to D6. There is no D4 stress die rating. How effect die creates stress starting from none. If all of your dice come up as hitches, that's called a botch. The narrator can inflict D6 stress of any type on your character and step it up by one for each hitch on the roll past the first. If this ends up being more than a D12, if you rolled five hitches, which is a D6 stepped up four times, it steps up existing stress past D12, your character is stressed out, and you do not get power points, or excuse me, plot points for a botch. During a recovery scene, from which your character spends most of the time sleeping, resting, or otherwise taking care of themselves, all of your stress dice except corrupted step down by one. At the beginning of your next session, all of your stress dice, again except for corrupted stress, also step down by one unless the narrator decides there is some reason for the stress to persist, such as you're on a cliffhanger. Activating one of the narrator's opportunities with a plot point lets you step down one stress die, even corrupted stress. This takes place immediately after the effect of the narrator's dice are resolved. Other characters can attempt to recover your stress by making a test against two rolls of a d8 plus the stress dice being resolved. If they succeed and their effect die is larger than your stress die, your stress goes away. If they succeed and the effect is equal to or smaller than your stress dice, your stress dice step down by one. If they fail, your stress remains the same. If they fail and get a hitch, your stress dice steps up by one, but you get the plot point. Corrupted stress usually requires dark magic or rune magic in some cases to purge it from your system. See Mage's Guide on page 146 about recovering from corrupted stress. Any stress die that has ever stepped up past D12, your character is stressed out, can no longer take part in the scene they are in. 
Once the scene is over and your character is somewhere where they can rest and recover, the stress die goes away entirely and is replaced by a d6 trauma die. For the rest of the current scene, your stress is still considered to be d12. This is important because if any reason you take more stress of the same sort that stressed you out, it goes straight to your trauma. We got examples of being stressed out. Pushing stress dice. I don't remember how much we talked about that in the primer. But you can choose to push your stress, your PC shoulders through their pain and suffering and uses it as a motivator rather than as a setback. To do this, spend a plot point and add your stress die to your own dice pool for your next roll. Unlike assets or other bonus dice, stress pushing stress like this only applies to a single roll. So if you push your stress during a competition or challenge, once the roll of the die is resolved in that step of the contest or challenge, the stress die leaves your dice pool. But pushing your stress has an additional cost. After you resolve the die roll, the stress die you included in your dice pool is stepped up by one. This may result in your PC being stressed out if the die is stepped up past 12. This means that even though you might be successful in your roll, you must accept the consequences immediately thereafter. I like that. Lots of examples of pushing stress dice. Last ditch effort. In some cases, you might be able to temporarily recover enough stress during a scene after you've been stressed out. That is something called a last ditched effort. This must be prompted by somebody trying to rouse you, snap out of it, or clear your head, or inspire you with words. Treat it as a test to recover stress with 2d8, difficulty plus the d12 stress you still have. Take note of the effect die. You may get to use it as an asset to your role. If they're successful, you can attempt something in the current scene so long as it's short or immediate sort of activity. This might be taking a turn in a challenge or making a test. A contest is probably out of the question. The downside is that you, instead of adding two dice to your total, you only get to use one. You can spend plot points to include more in your total as normal. We get examples of last ditch effort. Stress and growth. Anytime someone else helps you recover your stress, other than corrupted stress, you add the stress die to a pool of dice called your growth pool. You can use it to grow your character, modify your special effects and traits, and so forth. Even if the stress is not completely recovered, you still add a growth die equal to the size of your stress die before it was recovered. Not what it was after. So I think growth is like experience. Now here's our trauma. Trauma is like long-term stress. If trauma is ever stepped up past D12, your character is permanently out of options. They're dead, hopelessly incoherent, lost to their own psyche, or whatever seems most appropriate. Recovering trauma requires somebody else to make tests to help you. Ah, trauma won't step down on its own except at the beginning of a new tale. So here we've got information on tests and difficulty. Challenges, we talked a lot about this in the uh, primer. Making good stories, scenes, sessions, and tales. Character journal, using growth. So this is kind of like uh, experience, I suppose. Once you have dice in your growth pool, there are several ways to spend the dice to improve your character and update your character journal. Some can't be done. Some can be done session to session. Others take place at the end of a current tale. Also, while it doesn't necessarily use the growth pool directly, you can change and update your character's values and value statements. At the end of every session, perhaps in a tag scene designed for reflection, look at the values and value statements you questioned in play and decide if they should change. This form of growth doesn't use the growth pool, although the growth pool does serve to increase when you question your value statements. It's important to remember that intentionally stepping down your value to aid a friend during a test, contest, or challenge doesn't contribute to growth. If you have a value that was stepped down because you questioned it or you helped someone, ask yourself the following question for each value. Has my character's view of this value changed? If the answer is no, the value statement doesn't change, but the value stays stepped down. You must now step up another value in response so that your total steps and all of your values stays the same. No value could be raised above D12. Oh yeah, so there was this total amount that you can add across all of your values. If the answer is yes, the value steps back up to its original die rating, but you must rewrite your value statement to reflect your new views on this value. It should be a clear and obvious difference, not simply a rewritten version of the same statement. So what do we do with these growth points? We have adding relationship assets, improving your traits, choose a type of trait to change or affect from the following distinction, specialties, assets, or attributes. Doing any of these things requires a test against a difficulty set by the narrator based on the type of trait being changed and the die rating you want the trait to become, or what it currently is if you're not planning to step it up. From your dice pool, you use your current growth pool. For this test, hitches can't be activated, but still can't be used for your total. You don't need to choose an effect die for this test. It's a simple pass or fail. So use your two best results. You can't use plot points to affect this. So I guess this is the difficulty of doing, you know, adding an asset 
adding a specialty, step up an asset, step up a distinction. Okay, so here's an example here. Cam wants to upgrade his character's hot-headed sun mage distinction, which is currently a D8. Joe, as the narrator, builds a pool of dice to set the difficulty for the test, taking two dice from the growth difficulty by trait chart, which and adding an additional die from the rating Cam is targeting, which gives him 3D10. So if he is trying, he's trying to step up a distinction, so that's 2D10. Somehow he's getting another D10. Knowing he needs some very high dice, Cam looks at the growth pool he's got and decides to commit four of the dice from that pool to try to succeed. So the narrator's dice pool was 3D10. Cam apparently had a D8, 2D10, and D12 to spend in the growth pool. And it happened that Cam exceeded the uh, narrator's roll. So now the Sun Mage distinction, hot-headed Sun Mage, moves up to a D10. Okay. Creating your own character. Now, this was information that was not really in the primer, because I don't think it covered how to make a character at all. We're probably going to have to go over creating a character in another video. I kind of like doing standalone character creation videos, but I'd be interested to really go through this in detail. This is still kind of an overview. These things take a long time. <laughs> I get drawn in. Mages and Magic. Oh, so next is Mage's Guide. The Primal Sources. Looks like world information. Now we get into spells. When magic goes wrong. What happens when magic goes wrong? Even if you fail at your test, contest, or challenge, this doesn't mean the spell itself failed. It means it wasn't able to help you or get what you wanted with the effectiveness you had hoped. For this reason, we don't tend to encourage narrators to describe the terrible blunders with magic if dice rolls don't turn out well. On the other hand, hitches do indicate problems. Any die roll that includes magic traits and is part of an attempt to cast a spell to achieve an outcome is liable to hitches. When activated, the narrator should choose a type of stress to step up. Afraid, angry, exhausted, and insecure are all great choices. Use injured stress sparingly unless the spell that's cast invokes a particularly dangerous or perilous magic. So, of course, being Tales of Zadia, we've got, you know, Earth Magic, Moon Magic. So this looks like our spell lists within each one of these different Sky Magic, Sun Magic, Dark Magic spells. Dark Mages require a Dark Magic distinction, a Dark Magic specialty, and at least magical creature asset of some kind. Okay. The cost of Dark Magic, and that is Corruption. Dark magic leaves traces of itself behind any dark mage who uses it for length of time. This is represented by corruption, the special type of stress. As a dark mage, you may get corrupted stress when the narrator activates one of your hitches. You fail a roll using dark magic. One of your special effects give it to you. As a dark mage, you may include your corrupted stress in your dice pool when using dark magic. No plot point is required, but you must declare it ahead of time. The opposition pool then cannot use it in their roll against you. Unlike pushing stress, corrupted stress used in this way is only stepped up by one if you fail. If you have corrupted trauma, you can use it in the same way you have corrupted stress, but potentially unlocking dangerous powers. This seems like a, a pretty neat magic system. I need to look at it in a lot more detail. But I think there is uh, a lot here. I, I do like this. You know, I can definitely tell why my friends told me to go check out Cortex. And I understand there's a lot of different things that you can change about Cortex, and of course this is like Cortex engineered to support the Tales of Zadia game, and the Tales of Zadia world. So rune magic. It's a completely different kind of system from Dungeons & Dragons, which I like. Then this is the Narrator's Guide, so I guess now we're getting into things like the Dungeon Master's Guide. Be well rested to be the narrator. <laughs> uh, make sure you've had sleep and are not worn out or fatigued. What? We used to play all night. <laughs> but I suppose the games did go downhill by the time we were playing for you know 12 or 14 hours straight because of fatigue. <laughs> so information on how to be a narrator. Their word for game master. A dozen narrator characters. Oh, so NC is narrator character rather than non-player character. Narrating the game, setting up the scene and framing types of scenes. The tale unfolding, developing a chronicle, featured catalysts, and then the tale of the corrupted core. And it said the game master should read this, so I believe this is uh, uh, a whole uh, game adventure module for you. Act one. So no sense in going into this in too much detail. 
Although I'm glad that it provides this. It looks like this actually takes up, well, okay. That's not that big a chunk of the, the book, actually. I like having example um, adventures for the game master to be able to play. I might actually prefer it to not be in the core book because other people have got to reference this core book. <laughs> the game master has to also use it to, uh, to run the game. I actually kind of like for it to be a standalone. Appendix. Oh, I think these are your uh, pre-generated characters. And then distinctions in detail, family distinctions, vocation distinctions, magical vocations. I guess this is quirk distinctions. All of the special effects. This seems like a useful appendix. Glossary and index. How to fill in the blank character journal. Probably also these are available online, I would guess. And of course, it does have the uh, online system for character uh, running your character online as well. We looked at that uh, in another video. Now that you've explored this world, now prime your own. Cortex Prime Game Handbook, which is probably something I need to get. Build your own role-playing game primed by Cortex, the award-winning, completely modular and customizable tabletop role-playing system. Combine hundreds of modifications, traits, and mechanics for your favorite genres and theme them to wholly create your role-playing experience. Explore simple-to-understand guides all brought to life in full color and designed by 50 global artists. Play Cortex Prime right away with three spotlight settings. Uh, I'm probably going to have to get the Cortex Prime book at some point. But okay, that is our brief look at the Tales of Zadia flipping through. I, I'm kind of excited about it because I can see why people uh, recommended the Cortex system to me. I do like the Dragon Prince TV show. Might be fun to try out and get to the table. I've got some other friends who enjoyed uh, the Dragon Prince. There's probably a lot to learn about running the Cortex system correctly, though. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and all of that jazz. It really helps a lot. But also, please check out The Cultists, the web series on this channel about modern-day D&D playing Lovecraftian cultists who just want to worship Cthulhu in a world full of people who just don't understand. Season 1 is on the channel now. But also, please check out my YouTube channel. I have over 150 videos on tabletop games and the fantasy genre. If you've enjoyed this video, you might enjoy many of them as well. I look forward to seeing you for them and many more videos to come. Later.